Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Alicki. I am a national program consultant with the American Heart Association, and I will be your moderator for this session. On behalf of the American Heart Association, I would like to welcome you to our third session of today's Close the Space Secondary Prevention of ASCVD Care Education Virtual Summit. All presentations will be recorded and available within the coming weeks at heart.org forward slash ASCVD. Our next presentation is titled Alert. Can clinical decision support tools prompt better quality ASCVD care? It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Ralph J. Riello III. Dr. Riello is a board certified clinical pharmacy specialist with expertise in cardiovascular critical care, previously embedded within the coronary intensive care unit at Yale New Haven Hospital for over six years. He currently teaches several pharmacology related lectures for the Yale University Physicians Associate Online and Traditional Programs, as well as the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Riello is also an integral member of the Clinical and Translational Research Accelerator, where he is an investigator on many innovative and practice-changing clinical trials in cardiovascular, renal, and metabolic disease. Dr. Riello, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Rebecca, and welcome everybody, and thank you for joining um, my presentation this afternoon. Uh, here's my disclosures, and we'll begin first with uh, reviewing the objectives uh, for today's presentation. Um, we'll start by identifying the persistent evidence practice gaps for lipid-lowering therapy, or LLT, for patients with very high-risk atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or VHR ASCVD. Then we're going to walk through some innovative strategies we've been working on, my research group, to help improve quality of care for patients with ASCVD by using the electronic health record and embedding clinical decision support tools to help coach prescribers to make evidence-based lipid-lowering therapy treatment decisions. We'll also be reviewing the impact of some of those best practice alerts that we've deployed throughout our electronic health record on lipid-lowering therapy prescribing rates consistent with the most recent evidence-based guidelines for patients within our health system with ASCVD that have been shown from the recent PROMP lipid trial presented last fall at the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions Conference. First, we're going to start by defining some of the gaps in ASCVD care. I know we've already heard a little bit about today, but I'm hopefully going to, going to take a little bit of a different tact. And, and I think this, this problem persists with, with chronic disease management in general, and it really comes down to what's known as a knowledge translation gap, where it takes about 17 years on average from, you know, groundbreaking randomized controlled trials published in New England Journal to actually translate through guidelines and then trickle down to actually be adopted by providers as the standard of care. This has been a long treatment dissemination gap that uh, is, is no stranger to ASCVD patients. And I've highlighted some of the landmark trials for secondary prevention for patients um, with TIA or stroke from Sparkle, Miracle, ASCVD patients, as well as the Prove It Timmy trial for post-MI patients using high intensity statins also shown several guideline publications um, that have helped us guide our treatment decisions for evidence-based lipid-lowering therapy for patients with ASCVD. And, and sure that although the first trial came out here in maybe 2000, 2001, and the most recent updated guidelines we have are from 2018, that's about 17 years. However, this is just an average because we know this has been a dissemination gap or implementation science gap um, that we've really been struggling with as frontline clinicians caring for patients with ASCVD. And, and although we have already known that large proportions of patients with dyslipidemia do not achieve their LDLC goals, and we need to be more aggressive about the treatment for these patients in order to um, attain these LDLC targets. And significant gaps have existed between guidelines and clinical practice for quite some time. Sounds like what we've been living with, right? However, this is from an article in 2000. Perhaps we've gotten better over time addressing this gap. However, it's been published afterwards that large cohorts of patients, even with acute coronary syndrome, are not discharged on the lowering therapy, and we need to do much better as clinicians to help address that implementation gap and prescribe more guideline-recommended intensive statin therapy, especially for those high-risk post-MI patients. 
sounds like what we've been living with, right? Unfortunately, also, this is from an article published back in 2010. So this has been something we've been struggling with in ACVD for quite some time, even across a contemporary commercial database of patients with secondary prevention ASCVD, so a history of MI, a history of stroke or, or purple artery disease, patients who should be by all intents and purposes on high intensity statins and achieving their goal, still significant and persistent treatment gaps for these patients persist. And only about half of these commercial payers are prescribed any statin whatsoever. 20, uh, less than one fourth of them are actually prescribed the appropriate or recommended high intensity statin. And unfortunately, fewer than one third ever achieve that target LDLC goal of less than 70. Even if we follow these patients longitudinally over time, as we've learned from the Gould registry, less than one in every five of these patients has any changes made to the lipid lowering therapy over the course of two years follow-up. So lots of treatment gaps that need to be addressed. And this, this addresses really um, the crux of, of what motivated our prompt lipid study is that with patients with very high risk ASCVD, there is a huge unmet need here. By the time I'm done giving this presentation, there will be about 60 patients that have had an either a heart attack or a stroke across the country. We do know, as you've heard multiple times today, that cardiovascular disease remains the number one killer in the world, certainly in the United States. We've known for decades that lipid lowering therapy or LDLC is an incredibly modifiable risk factor for patients with ASCVD in order to reduce their risk of subsequent events. However, as we've just outlined, the gold standard lipid lowering therapy used to treat these patients um, is, is very, very poorly um, uptake across the country even for the patients at the highest risk. So I'm not gonna spend too much time reviewing the um, 2018 multi-society guidelines for, for cholesterol therapy, um, as they've been addressed multiple times um, earlier in the summit today. But I just wanna highlight some key points here as uh, sort of Nishant had shared previously, um, the goal for patients as currently with ASCVD, so established cardiovascular disease, um, should be 70, uh, less than 70 milligrams for deciliter LDLC. They can achieve that by doing a high intensity statin or ideally the maximum tolerated statin, adding ezetima or um, ezetimibe or zetia, as well as considering non-statin therapies like PCSK9 inhibitor monoclonal antibodies. We're fortunate actually to receive an expert consensus guideline update um, from the ACC just last year looking more closely at those non-statin uh, non therapies as we know patients often don't achieve their LDLC goal of less than 70, despite their disproportionate high risk. So advocating more for a lower level goal consistent with the European Society of Guidelines to actually achieve an LDLC of less than 55 and doing so by earlier or more upstream therapies that don't include statin, novel PCSK9 inhibitors, for example, pentadoic acid, and even some um, uh, RNAi interference therapies targeting PCSK9 like in glycerin. So you would think with multi-society guidelines endorsing this practice that encompass nearly every specialty of provider, um, that there would be some uh, enhanced motivation perhaps to, to really aggressively treat this, this persistently undertreated patient population. However, as we've shown from the data, that's currently not the case. So we need to look for more innovative tools and approaches um, to help bridge that knowledge translation gap I reviewed earlier. And, and I do think that clinical decision support strategies um, embedded within the electronic health record can certainly be a winning strategy for that. So just briefly to review and level set about what clinical decision support or CDS tools actually are and how they can work, they must first accomplish what's called the five rights. Similar to the five rights of nursing scope of practice for medication safety, um, these can also be applied here to clinical decision support tools. They first need to be informative. That means they better contain evidence-based information that the provider needs to know that's relevant to the particular patient that the clinical decision support tool or the alert or what have you may actually fire for while that patient is there at the point of care. Of course, it needs to ping the most relevant people that should include the provider. There's also other patient-facing tools integrated in my chart or other apps um, that can also directly engage the patient. And some of those have been useful in the literature as well. Third, 
think one of the five rights should be that the uh, clinical and support tool should, should flow through the appropriate channel for the prompt lipid trial, which we'll address later. Um, we chose the EHR rather than sort of embedded in basket messaging or other strategies um, because the, UH, the EHR, for example, is, is a really ubiquitous platform for providers to document care to prescribe new therapies. And we figured that is sort of the home base that we want to optimize to make sure that no matter where the patient goes, any encounter, they can um, uh, be exposed to sort of our clinics and support optimization tool um, and, and receive uh, better care. The format should also be um, sort of customized to fit the needs of, of what you're trying to accomplish. And, and for the prompt lipid trial, we chose a BPA or a best practice alert with an embedded smart set or order set um, accompanied with it to make sure that hey, we're alerting clinicians to an opportunity to optimize care, and then also sort of hitting an easy button for them that uh, dynamic smart set will then recommend whatever therapies um, uh, that patient should be on by all rights. Um, and five, and very importantly, um, that clinician support tool should also fit within the workflow. Ideally, it should even streamline the clinical workflow. And, and like I mentioned earlier, sort of provide an easy button for the provider at the point of care that, that can help sort of standardize the approach to making evidence-based clinical decisions. And, and if, you, if you accomplish all of those five rights when you're working on developing a clinical decision su uh, support tool, is that you, hopefully you'll also um, ensure that it does what it's supposed to by uh, sort of accomplishing the triple aim. And, and for that, I think safety is the most important. We do hear very clearly from frontline clinicians that the alerts embedded in an EHR system can, can cause alert fatigue and that can lead to provider burnout and actually missed safety opportunities and safety events um, that may unfortunately end up reaching a patient. We also need to actually test, ideally in a rigorous randomized controlled trial, whether or not an alert or a CDS tool actually accomplished what it means to accomplish. So using a measurable primary endpoint, ensuring that based and compared with usual care, the alert in DEF Act does accomplish what it was supposed to and doesn't just end up annoying our frontline providers without offering any benefit. And third and most important, I think, too, is that in order to ensure a high level of engagement and, and positive feedback from providers who are exposed to the alert, um, you do really have to make sure that you're, you're assessing and developing that alert um, with a high degree of usability. So that includes incorporating frontline feedback from the clinicians who are going to be exposed to see the alert. Uh, providers who see this patient population, give them a voice, you know, do focus groups, incorporate their opinions and, and ask, you know, uh, specific questions about what can you do with a CDS tool to help sort of improve or streamline their workflow. Um, that tends to make much happier clinicians and, and less alert fatigue affected uh, provider burnout. So getting into what we try to accomplish with the prompt trials is that, of course, these are in general, cardiovascular disease studies. So we have to have an acronym um, in order for folks to remember what we're doing here. And, and in, that, in that vein, PROMPT stands for the pragmatic trials of messaging to providers about treatment. And the follow-up will always be sort of what disease state we're looking to tackle or close an evidence practice gap in to make sure that we're uh, you know, incorporating the best, most recent evidence-based medicine and, and overcoming clinical inertia to bring these recommended therapies to patients wherever they may be. We have several ongoing studies that are part of the prompt family of trials, and we've had much success with some of the previous ones, uh, but today we're going to be focusing on um, the prompt lipid trial, which as I mentioned earlier, was presented as a featured science presentation uh, last fall at the AHA conference in November of 2022. So first, I'm going to begin with sort of how we've approached the prompt studies by applying some of those clinical decision support tool principles that I reviewed earlier. And the first study that we completed uh, was prompt HF, where we aimed to close the persistent treatment gap of guideline-directed medical therapy for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. And by that, we designed a user-centered best practice alert pictured here on the slide that incorporated frontline clinician input. We went through a myriad of focus groups from our highest volume heart failure providers. Um, I was able to find out who those were by running pharmacy reports to pull in providers who are prescribing high amounts of Secubidrol Valsartan or Entresto or SGLT2 inhibitors for these patients because I figured they were practicing the highest degree of evidence-based medicine per the recent guidelines. And I, I really want to hear their input on how I can build an alert to help coach other providers to close those treatment gaps when those, um, when those opportunities arise. They also gave some feedback to us about you know, where this alert should deploy, when it should fire, 
Um, I do tend to pick on the um, influenza alert a lot because um, that bothers me in my inpatient practice. Every time I open a chart during flu season, which thankfully will be ending soon, um, I'm you know faced with an alert no matter what my role is caring for that patient um, right when I open the chart, irrespective of what I was trying to do by looking in the chart. And, and that may not be as helpful or may actually contribute to alert fatigue, but you can actually control with a high degree of granularity where that alert can deploy and when it fires and what criteria makes it do so. So um, for both prompt HF and prompt lipid, we actually set the alert to only fire in the outpatient encounter setting when the provider is actually engaging or modifying the patient's medication section of the electronic health record. Um, and in that vein, we thought that the psychology of I'm already reviewing these medications and I'm already thinking about making a change, then the provider will be exposed to this alert and help coach them to make an evidence-based treatment decision. And we need to make sure that these best practice alerts indeed fire when they're supposed to, and do not fire when they're not supposed to. So through iterative usability testing, so multiple iterations of the alert um, run in sort of silent mode or in a playground um, hyperspace arena where um, patient care won't be directly affected, you can retrospectively go back and review to make sure, did the patients that the alert fired for meet the criteria that we want it to? And were there patients that potentially were missed that met that criteria, but the alert didn't fire? So you can go back and tweak the alert to make sure that high degree of sensitivity and specificity. It's also important to make sure that you bring all of the correct sort of features um, that might be relevant to any treatment decisions in the screen, easy to view. So for a prompt HF, naturally we display the ejection fraction, any relevant labs, vital signs, as well as any current and omitted guideline directed medical therapy, making it very clear um, what therapies the patients are currently prescribed that might count as guideline therapy and what ones they're missing and whether or not the patient's eligible for. And here's where the easy button comes in next. There have to be sort of linked or embedded features where with very simple, maybe one, maybe two clicks, a provider can then order those recommended but omitted therapies as long as the patient's eligible. And of course, as we're sticklers for evidence-based medicine, having a hyperlink to the most recent clinical practice guidelines that these recommendations are based from only can help serve to educate the providers at the point of care as well. So from prompt to HF, um, increase the uh, likelihood of providers exposed to the alert for prescribing guideline direct medical therapy by about 40%. And what is more, in fact, perhaps maybe even more rewarding than finally tackling this GDMT problem in HEFREF was that the providers who saw the alert actually liked it. They said that the alert was effective or very effective 80% of the time. And about half of the providers who saw it made the GDMT recommendation changes at some point after they were exposed to the alert. One out of every four providers accept these recommendations as they were, and only about 13% of providers uh, dismiss the alert away. And, and for those of you who may not be familiar with alerts or clinical data support literature, um, these numbers are usually inverse. Most alerts can be ignored up to about 96% of the time, immediately dismissed without reading. And of course, that may contribute to alert fatigue for sure. But getting this kind of feedback from the frontline providers um, was really rewarding as they think that we're on the right track here. And that was some of the motivation for um, then applying this process um, this rigorous upfront evaluation with frontline clinical providers who care for ASCVD patients to be part of, of designing and developing this alert for the prompt lipid study. So I have the alert featured here on the slide and you may notice a lot of similarities from the prompt HF alert on the previous slide. The same principles were applied here, except we actually um, pulled in the highest volume ASCVD providers um, by looking at a similar approach, but rather than heart failure therapies, we actually look for the highest volume PCS canine inhibitor monoclonal antibody prescribers over the course of the year across our health system because we felt those providers, you know, going through the prior authorization hurdles or what have you at the time to really you know, reach in their toolkit and use non-statin therapies and prescribe them to patients that they're probably seeing the highest risk patients more often than others. And I want to really hear from them how I can make their life easier by incorporating a CDS tool to help coach other providers to make evidence-based lipid lowering therapy decisions. So as you can see here, similar to the alert on the previous slide, relevant labs, LDL cholesterol, even some liver function tests in case people had concerns about statin hepatotoxicity as well as the current 
but also emitted lipid lowering therapy. So this patient in the example was not on a high intensity statin, but on torvastatin 20. It's very clear here that that patient was prescribed that therapy. However, there is some therapies that are missing. So in that embedded order set, if the provider clicks accept, which is default here, so just one click, hit enter, and the dynamic order set will pop up. Providers can then be shown what therapies the patient is recommended for by the guidelines, eligible for based on their criteria, but not currently prescribed. And because it's a dynamic order set or smart set, um, it would only show sort of the options that are eligible for that patient. So had the patient been on a high intensity statin, so, you know, a torvastatin 40 or 80, um, this top portion under high intensity statins would not even be visible to the provider. So really streamlining what you see on the screen in order to make sure that it's as easy as possible directly at the point of care that providers can make these evidence-based treatment decisions. So for that patient who may have been on a high intensity statin already, they'll only be exposed to sort of the recommended ezetimibe therapy as well as the PCSK9 inhibitor monoclonal antibodies. And because one of the other quality gaps in ASCVD care includes a lack of routine monitoring and follow-up, once lipid lowering therapy treatment decisions are made, we also default pre-checked a hyperlipidemia coded um, LDL panel to make sure that it's routed to the primary care doctor. So multiple providers who may touch this patient throughout their journey and care in the outpatient setting will be looped in and communicated with clearly and someone will be responsible for following up on that level and potentially making more treatment changes if they're indicated because the patient has not yet reached their goal. So now that we've sort of explained some of the CDS tools that were studied in the prompt lipid trial, let's learn a little bit more about what motivated um, the study in general. And of course, uh, prompt stands or something, as I mentioned before, here focusing on hyperlipidemia therapy, so prompt lipid. Now, overall, the objective of the trial was really just to promote those evidence-based lipid lowering therapy intensifications for patients with established ASCVD in the outpatient setting using the alerts that I showed you previously. Now, the study was a cluster randomized controlled trial where we consented 100 providers in the outpatient setting um, who were then going to enroll patients. And the providers are randomized in sort of a one-to-one -one fashion using a permuted block um, randomization schema to either be exposed to the, uh, um, that alert that I showed you previously or usual care, so a silent alert. And because this was an entirely pragmatic trial, completely embedded in the EHR, zero patients in either arm were lost to follow-up and all data was then available for analysis after study conclusion. And although we consented a full 100 providers, um, we actually achieved our sample size enrollment target prior to four of those 100 providers actually having time to see an eligible patient. So this is what enrollment looked like a little bit more closely. Now, in the outpatient setting, again, it could have been any clinic that was affiliated with one of the old school minute, um, you know, even health systems teaching hospital, all across basically the shoreline of Connecticut. Now, the study started um, over two years ago in the fall of 2021, and it actually completed enrollment after the first patient was recruited in just about six or seven months, which should tell you that there's a lot of high-risk ACVD patients out there that are not at their LDL goal and also not on their optimal lipid lowering therapy as well. And now this study was funded by an investigator initiated research grant from Amgen, the manufacturer of Ilocumab or Repatha. However, all FDA approved PCSK9 inhibitor uh, monoclonal antibodies at the time were certainly included as options uh, to be prescribed to patients. A little bit more about what that patient population that was recruited in the trial looked like. Overall, there were 2,500 patients at least 18 years or older seen in any of those clinics that I mentioned previously. Now, we used a modified definition of very high risk atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, um, similar to the definition you may have seen previously from some of the uh, guidelines that have been published in the past. Um, however, we more so focused on patients with secondary prevention. So anyone with an event with or without any of those other high risk features, such as being elderly, having diabetes, heart failure, or smoking, um, that would actually define very high risk from just high risk. Now, our provider subjects, remember, these were the 96 providers that we consented for the trial. 
I mentioned that they could have been practicing in any outpatient clinic affiliate with the only health system. Um, and based on the recruitment practice, we have just about 50 cardiologists and a good mix of internists as well as advanced practice providers as well. And remember, they just had to have a high frequency of ASCVD patients seen based on that retrospective review I discussed earlier. Now, baseline population here was well balanced as you would expect from a randomized controlled trial with 2,500 patients. These were a little bit older than your Medicare beneficiaries, but a very strong representation of female gender with about half of our patients enrolled there. And the race and ethnicity makeup was pretty consistent with the overall New Haven metropolitan area where the majority of the study um, recruitment took place um, with about one in every five patients having chronic kidney disease, over a third having diabetes, and almost 90% of each having hypertension. Also a good representation of peripheral artery disease too. So again, can't emphasize enough, these were secondary prevention patients who very much ought to be aggressively treated with evidence-based lipid flowing therapy. And because affiliated with an academic teaching hospital that has had affiliations with Get With The Guidelines, um, our sort of overall baseline statin prescribing rate was a little bit higher than I've showed you in some of the previous literature um, with just about less than half of patients um, being prescribed the appropriate high intensity statin, less than 10% being on ezetimibe, and just around 2.5% being prescribed a PCSK9 inhibitor. And this is pretty reflective of contemporary um, lipid lowering therapy management across the country. Now, the primary endpoint for the prompt lipid trial is pictured here, and it was any intensification of lipid lowering therapy compared with providers that were exposed to the alert versus usual care or eligible patients, but the providers were not exposed to the alert that we showed earlier. And similar to actually the, the, the similar primary endpoint in the prompt HF trial, we also saw about a 40% increase in the likelihood to intensify lipid lowering therapies in providers who were exposed to that alert. However, that primary endpoint did not achieve statistical significance. So it's just a numerical association um, with a higher likelihood to um, in intensify lipid lowering therapy, um, but unfortunately did not achieve the p value of less than 0.05. Now, because we still wanted to inform practice, we looked back through. Um, some of the engagements um, with the alert and noticed that there was a high degree of patients um, whose providers had deferred making an evidence-based lipid lowering therapy treatment decision when they were exposed to the alert. And because of this high degree of sort of deferral to primary care, to the primary cardiologist, but not the provider necessarily exposed to the alert, we were wondering that maybe if there's a treatment effect of the alert, where if it's not immediately dismissed, then you know providers actually engage with the alert is there something meaningful then happening with the lowering therapy um, for those patients? And, and there did seem to be, of course, because we didn't achieve the primary endpoint, uh, less than 0.05, this is hypothesis generating, but it's certainly very encouraging that we saw more than a doubling in the likelihood of, of providers exposed to the alert who actually engaged with the alert, um, did not immediately dismiss it um, to intensify lipid lowering therapy. And, and that was seen across all sort of avenues of the lowering therapy, which included statin intensifications, adding ezetimibe, as well as even prescribing a PCSK9 inhibitor monoclonal antibody. And um, similar to what we did in the prompt uh, HF trial, we, we sort of coined this term of, you know, how many alerts we sort of have to fire in order for a provider to make a meaningful evidence-based change in that patient's therapy after being sound shown to the alert. And, and similar to prompt HF, we saw almost identical number needed to alert of nine. So, so nine sort of providers were alerted and engaged with the alert, thought at least one patient would have their lipid lowering therapy intensified. Now, all of the results, including some of the secondary endpoints, are summarized here on this slide. I won't review some of the things we discussed earlier with the primary um, and the per protocol analysis, but it's just really encouraging to see that the alert did seem to work if providers actually read it, up to five times more likely to prescribe a PCSK9 inhibitor and about twice as likely to prescribe all other sort of tools in the toolkit for lipid lowering therapy beyond PCSK9. As far as secondary outcomes, again, um, we were not adequately powered to detect differences, especially low event rates, um, given that the study only did about six month outcomes for patients who were exposed to the alert. However, all of these sort of seem to be trending in the right direction with a higher proportion of patients in the alert arm um, actually achieving an LDL goal of 70 numerically, also even the more intense 
uh, LDLC goal that may be coming down the pike in the future of less than 55. Um, there were numerically lower ED visits and hospitalizations as well as death, again, but just not adequately powered to really detect differences here. So um, re uh, reassuring for sure, but, um, uh, but, but um, uh, can't really be interpreted. Now, similar to sort of what I've reviewed in Prompt AGF, uh, the findings themselves are great. We have alerts here that seem to be able to impact practice um, with a very consistent 40% increase in the likelihood to increase therapy. Uh, but the provider survey here is also really important. I want to get that feedback from, from the frontline providers exposed um, to the alert and, and see what their thoughts were. And, and sort of in the same vein as, as the earlier trial, prompt HF survey response, so about half of the patients who viewed the alert you know, made those changes. And if not now, during that current visit, they did so at some point in the future. And we know, given that very few patients followed longitudinally with ASCVD have any changes to lipid lowering therapy, we were certainly pleased to see that it's making some impact, if not now, maybe down the road. What we did, um, uh, I have some challenges with was that um, about a third of the providers did defer um, any treatment decisions based on the alert um, and to a primary care doctor or a cardiologist. We, we sort of had left an open field of comments in the alert if providers were deferring that they could fill in some information for to sort of give us an idea. And, and overwhelmingly, it was sort of no one really wanting to take ownership of making that treatment decision at that encounter. Um, and, and falling much farther behind than that deferral option um, was, was documenting that the patient had refused any treatment in the past. So um, again, reassuring given that most alerts are ignored immediately upon reading, um, but, but definitely still some room for improvement and perhaps some, some, something to learn here about provider selection uh, who may, be, may or may not be exposed to the alert. As far as safety endpoints, there are no differences here in liver function tests, any creatinine or creatinine kinase measurements as well. And there were no differences in the subgroups either. And we know that age can certainly be a modifier for um, whether or not a prescriber uh, may want to prescribe a statin, um, but we saw no difference there. I've, we've learned earlier today that females tend to be undertreated with ACPT. We did not see a difference here. Um, and it didn't seem to, to make a difference whether or not you're you know, a physician, advanced practice provider, or what your baseline LDLC was at study enrollment, and whether or not um, you had private or uh, com commercial or, or government-sponsored um, prescription drug coverage. So some of the limitations I've addressed, a few of them already, was that um, this study was conducted in just one single health system across the only even health, I mean, the ambulatory care setting, where EPIC is the EHR for both the inpatient and the outpatient. Um, so it's sort of unclear maybe how these findings may be applied to the inpatient setting or in other EHR platforms. And like most alert studies that rely on ICD-10 coding, we all know some of the limitations of coding um, is that uh, it's only as good as the coding was put in. And, and we did use a modified ACBD definition, um, but definitely did want to target those secondary prevention patients, um, no matter what their other high-risk features might be. And although we did take steps to limit any crossover awareness from our prescribers that were consented to the study um, with cluster randomization, um, there certainly could, still could have been some sort of water cooler talk about internalizing best practices for lipid lowering therapy between treatment arms. And, um, and I, I mentioned this earlier about providers deferring a lot of these lipid lowering therapy treatment decisions. Um, we, wanna, we wanna learn a bit more about that to refine the alert to make sure that we're only targeting clinicians with, with a high likelihood to, to sort of want to make these changes and comfortable with doing so based on the recommendations from a best practice alert. So I know I reviewed a lot of information with you two guys today, but um, to summarize the take home points for you, I, I really can't emphasize enough how persistent this treatment gap for patients, even with the highest risk ASCVD has, has really impacted the field of cardiovascular research and, and stunned many, many scholars looking to try and address this gap um, over the past several decades. Now, EHR embedded tools like best practice alerts, all falling under that umbrella of clinical support strategies. Um, we think they certainly can positively influence a prescriber's likelihood to prescribe evidence-based lipid lowering therapy. And if those providers engage with the alert, um, they're much more likely to do so, to follow those guidelines and to intensify lipid lowering therapy right there at the point of care after a best practice alert has advised them to do so. And particularly because these CDS tools are very low cost, can be effective, um, 
the most benefit, I think, is that they can be rapidly scaled across an integrated delivery network or learning healthcare system to really impact a larger population of health. And, and I think this certainly warrants further study, not just in other care settings, like you know in the hospital after PCI or MI, but also across other EHR platforms, um, you know, non-EHR, EHR agnostic, FHIRs, uh, um, anything that can be sort of open this up to, to more institutions to have access to incorporate CDS tools like this into their own health system and, of course, measure those effects as well. So I want to thank you guys so much for all of your time and attention today, and I'd love to invite any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Riello, for your presentation. Um, we have about four minutes for some questions. Um, at this time, I would like to encourage our participants to type those questions into the Q&A box. And again, we have about four minutes to answer those. Um, we do have one question. Um, alert fatigue is a concern for many frontline clinicians and has consequences for safety, patient safety, as well as contribute to provider burnout. How did this trial help to address that barrier? Yeah, wow, so great question, Rebecca. Um, the, the question's really getting to a, a, a common challenge, um, I think, practicing in the front line using the electronic health record today, combating alert fatigue. And, and we do hear from many providers that uh, another alert, in fact, it's a strategic decision for across the health system to eliminate about 10% of all the alerts that fire uh, across the hospital now. Um, so it, it's definitely being recognized as a big challenge, but but we, we we wanted to bring sort of a different tax to that and not contribute to alert fatigue. So um, we did so through several sort of different pathways. One, incorporating those frontline clinicians who complain about the alerts to actually come in, have a seat at the table and, you know, tell us what they think would actually make their life easier. Anything that can sort of give them that easy button, like I discussed to streamline workflow, you know, tinker with where the alert fires and set very specific criteria where, you know, that prompt lipid alert would not fire if your patient achieved their LDL goal. But if they're not at their goal and they're not an optimized therapy, it should really just capture more so that low hanging fruit uh, where it's very clear this patient is eligible to be optimized and, you know, make sure it fires at that point of care when the provider's already thinking about medications, not necessarily right when they open the chart. So, so we did really think and want to be sensitive to alert fatigue because we know it's a huge challenge, especially in the HR studies today. But, but we did try to incorporate a lot of those principles to, um, to make sure that it didn't necessarily, you know, hinder good patient care, but actually might help facilitate those treatment decisions. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have time for just one more quick question. Um, once prompt lipid is available for users, can it be edited for different institutions? Yeah, so great question. So right, so this is uh, this these kind of studies are really only as good as what you can show beyond your own neighborhood. And and sure, we were very pleased with the results of prompt lipid across my own health system. But but how important would it be if to you know share these best practice alerts um, with other institutions? And and we we so very much encourage that. Um, we've been working on some build guides um, to help other institutions looking to sort of incorporate a CDS tool like this. Um, and, you know, what works for the culture at my institution, you know, what my frontline prescribers want to see and alert who care for ASCBD patients might look a little bit different than what the clinicians maybe on the West Coast have, or maybe in another health system, or maybe even a small community hospital, um, maybe even using a different EHR platform. So, so we very much encourage, incorporate, you know, these sort of CDS tools. We, we certainly did the best we could to generate an evidence-based one with a randomized trial, so we know it works at our institution, um, but, but we re recognize that, you know, some of those cultural differences might be, uh, might warrant, you know, don't display the AST, ALT, you know, labs there because perhaps they might discourage pe people from intensifying statin therapy. Um, there's a lot of different approaches you could take, and, and I'm really excited to see what the, um, what the rest of uh, our, our cardiovascular medicine colleagues do across the country, um, you know, generating some of their own evidence or, or perhaps even partnering with us to collaborate on, a, on an expansion trial as well. And, and we would certainly welcome that too. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Riello, for this great presentation and thank you to our audience for your participation. Coming up next at 2.15 p.m. Central Time, we have our final plenary session titled Maintaining Health Equity for ASCVD in Rural Areas. At this time, please use the Return to Lobby link on your screen to choose your next session from the presentations list. Thank you very much for attending today's summit. We will see you shortly. <laughs>